just to kind of give you a bit of contextualization on the genesis of this paper, um, I've kind of been thinking about some of these issues for a while now and, and sort of working on them in, in different ways, but about this time last year, I was reading, um, what was it? Started with reading Bart Ehrman's book on uh, memory, his you know, groundbreaking book on memory. And uh, <laughs> he kind of had this aside where he talks about um, the spread of uh, the gospel in uh, earliest Christianity through kind of oral, spread of oral tradition. But he has this sort of aside where he gives this hypothetical scenario of uh, a Christian or a, a convert who um, then suddenly goes on a business trip and uh, converses with business associates who then also convert to Christianity. And I just thought, okay, this is a really interesting and weird way of framing the development of Christian origins. Um, about the same time, uh, at my previous institution, the University of Auckland, this um, email from a pie came out suggesting that we all apply for this money on research into entrepreneurialism. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not there anymore, so I, could, I couldn't follow through with actually applying for this. But I, w I was thinking, OK, yeah, this is, this is great, because I can apply for this money on research into entrepreneurialism, look at it in the Bible, and then kind of tear it apart. Um, so that was my goal, uh, but it's been a kind of slow process of getting to this point, and I think this paper as well is sort of a bridge between what I'm currently working on and what I want to work on next. So the language of uh, entrepreneurialism is rife today uh, through more or less all genres of discourse, uh, popular, political, or academic. And one way the ideology of neoliberalism um, that is the normative rationality of contemporary global capitalism that uh, orders people to live by the generalised uh, principle of competition in basically all areas of social life. One of the ways this has become entrenched is what David Harvey calls a hegemonic mode of discourse, uh, or what my personal cur uh, my current favourite view uh, of Philip Morovsky describes as a set of epistemic commitments over the past 40 years or so is through a constant practice of dehistoricizing, uh, universalizing, and uh, internalizing some of its key ideas. And one of the, the key ideas or assumptions is that the world consists largely of individual entrepreneurial agents uh, seeking to maximize their own human capital. So in this paper, I'm going to demonstrate how New Testament scholarship itself can be complicit in this process of dehistoricizing and universalizing some of the kind of key assumptions or core assumptions of neoliberal ideology or perhaps epistemology, specifically by fishing for entrepreneurs in the ancient economy. Now, on the surface level, I guess this means that scholars are perhaps guilty of anachronism. Uh, but I think on a much deeper level, it reveals a pro this process through which neoliberalism is becoming, or has become basically, a totalizing uh, ideological uh, framework, or perhaps a hermeneutical frame. We can't not but avoid uh, seeing the world, even when we're reading ancient texts and trying to be careful about contextualizing them in the ancient world, read through this frame, because we don't even know that we're doing it. The positive role uh, first ascribed to the entrepreneur uh, emerges explicitly in 20th century political economic thought. Joseph Schumpeter, uh, who writing in the 1930s, pinpointed the entrepreneur as a source of surplus value. And this becomes a way of explaining spontaneous and discontinuous changes in the economy without having to refer to extra economic factors like wars, religion, or politics. Prior to the 20th century, the entrepreneur, when he appears in economic theory at all, uh, is largely indistinguishable from the capitalist at the centre of classical economics or the petty capitalist trader within uh, mercantilist theory. Within the neoliberal era of capitalism, the entrepreneur remains an enigmatic and contentious figure. Campbell Jones and Andre Spicer, for instance, contend that discourse about entrepreneurship is often ambiguous and revolves around the gap or lack of repeated failure. Uh, for every success, there are, of course, 99 failures, right? Uh, 
which itself does not make notions of entrepreneurship less appealing, but actually more attractive and engaging to us. And it's so for this reason that they argue that the entrepreneur should be conceived of as a sublime object, that is a figure of discourse which is attractive but ultimately empty. Now, of course, prior to the emergence of capitalism, and especially within an agrarian economy like that of first century Palestine, value created through entrepreneurial profit was probably not a significant factor, if it is to be considered a factor at all. Rather, economic value was found primarily in the factors of land represented by the landowner and labor represented by the peasantry and slaves. Two of these actors put forward value claims, the landowner collecting rent and the peasant claiming what we might now call a wage. It was not until the late 18th century that a third actor puts forward a further claim, namely the capitalist, whose claim rested on the production of value through venturing capital. Given this, the minority of the workforce, which does not directly work the land, has often caused confusion for New Testament scholars. Do fishermen and artisans, for instance, constitute some kind of middle class? Were they, as John Meyer and others puts it, put it, uh, relatively prosperous? And this, of course, uh, raises the question, well, relative to what? To slaves or, you know, that tends to not get defined. This is a common assertion to be found in biblical commentaries. But the, I mean, the Marxist uh, classicist G. M. de Croix, however, would say emphatically, no. The small independent producer was still subject to indirect and collective forms of exploitation primarily through payments and services not rendered from individual to individual, but rather extracted by the authority of the occupying regime. So first, um, just to set the scene a bit, uh, I want to give two what I think re quite revealing uh, examples of entrepreneurial language nested in the work, the writing of leading New Testament scholars. And my first um, example is found in a recent article by Burton Mack, um, who invites us to reimagine the pioneers of Christian thought as uh, intellectual entrepreneurs. He writes, there was no Christian Bible for the first three centuries, only myth makers, such as Paul, Mark, Thomas, John, all intellectual entrepreneurs, working in discourse networks that were carving out a social rationale for a new network of Jesus School associations. Mack's fascinating description of the development of early Christian uh, myth-making intriguingly bears some resemblance to an academic's mandate in the neoliberal university, does it not? The early Christian myth-makers are remodeled as a constituent part of the knowledge economy, engaging in knowledge production, demonstrating entrepreneurial conduct through participation in research networks, perhaps, via information exchange and so on. A bit like this conference, or why we're at this conference, perhaps. Very enterpri enterprising of us. I guess the question for me is, in what sense is our ideological context, uh, that of the modern university, and the way that the modern university has been reconstituted, shaping our own interpretation of the data that we're reading and interpreting? My second example, um, to return to, uh, by Ehrman, is found in his uh, introductory textbook to the New Testament um, about the spread of early Christianity and Paul's role in this. And so in this textbook, uh, Ehrman describes how Paul probably won over converts in the new cities he's, he visited by suggesting that Paul preached while on the job, uh, using his place of business as a point of contact with people to proclaim the gospel. And this all seems mildly reasonable. I mean, Ehrman isn't obviously the only one who, who makes this uh, point. However, what raises eyebrows is a few pages later when Ehrman puts forward, without evidence, a rather intriguing proposition. Did Paul and his companions set up a small business, a kind of Christian leather goods shop in the cities he ba he visit they visited? And then having posed this as a question in the subsequent chapters, Ehrman uh, proceeds with it as, you know, a hypothesis that turns into a fact, interestingly. So uh, Paul's multinational uh, 
Christian Leather Goods Corporation becomes the infrastructure for spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth. In each city that uh, Paul writes a letter to, he's already, or the ones that he established the church, he did so on the basis of starting this uh, small business. Now, I begin with these two broader examples um, to demonstrate just how embedded I think some of these <coughs> assumptions are within the discourse of the discipline. Uh, even if we marginally agree, uh, disagree or largely disagree with Mac or Ehrman on other aspects, we might read over this and not even kind of question it. Um, yet we should, I think, be quite suspicious of this sort of language. Um, it at least raises some of these questions that, I, that I'm wanting to raise. So, uh, as you can probably guess by the title of my paper, I'm now going to talk about the uh, fishermen in the Sea of Galilee and how this might apply to them. So I mentioned before that it's not uncommon to hear the fishermen described as coming from a relatively privileged uh, background. Uh, Dale Ellison and W.D. Davies, oh, by the way, yeah, meanwhile in the Sea of Galilee, uh, <laughs> describe uh, them as coming from the lower, lower in brackets, middle class. Uh, Mona Hooker suggests uh, that the reference to hired men indicates that the brothers were by no means poor men. As fishermen, they would have all been reasonably prosperous. Uh, John Meyer similarly notes that um, Mark's mention of hired workers gives the impression of a relatively prosperous fishing business on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Luke instead presents James and John not as workers for their father, but rather as, quote, business partners with Simon Peter. Uh, furthermore, he notes, quote, it is well to remember that the fishing business on the Sea of Galilee was a lively and prosperous one, at least for those who owned or oversaw the operations. A pivotal argument, uh, sorry, article uh, published by Casey Hansen uh, 20 years ago in the Biblical Theological Bulletin should have put, I think, a lot of this to rest. Um, applying social scientific criticism, Hansen forcefully argued that the fishers could hardly have been classed as entrepreneurs uh, in such a highly regulated, taxed, and hierarchical political economy. And he has the, this diagram is from the article where he kind of shows the complexity of the relationships within which these fishermen were embedded. So there's a whole kind of, sorry if you can't see it, but there's a whole kind of, uh, there's somewhere down here, and there's all this other stuff going on in terms of cycles of, of where the money that they might be coming in and going out and all this kind of stuff. It's complex. Um, so while the, the boat owners or fishermen uh, may or may not have been involved in fish processing, this would not have necessarily made them wealthy, and certainly not middle class, as some authors have contended, since the whole conceptualization of a middle class is anachronistic relative to Roman Palestine. The surplus went to, uh, as Hansen puts it, the brokers and the ruling elite. Now, a very recent article uh, from this year, in fact, and this is what got, sparked me to write on this particular topic, because there's been two articles that have come out this year uh, in New Testament journals on fishing. Um, and one of them was by Raimo Hakola in Novum Testamentum, asks us to re-examine the portrait of the Galilean fishing economy in light of fresh archaeological findings in Magdala, along with recent classical scholarship on ancient fishing technologies and fish production. In opposition to Hansen, so he does engage with Hansen, Hakola contends the expansion of Galilean fish production and trade uh, gave an economic boost to the local economy, and that local co collectors of fishermen were able to benefit from this development. So basically, we have a kind of trickle-down explanation to the, uh, for their so-called relative prosperity. And Hakola puts forward a number of pieces of evidence to support this claim. Uh, first, excavations in Magdala reveal an urban character uh, and harbour dating to the first century BCE, which suggests large industrial-scale fishing and trade in the region. Structures such as storage facilities and port structures bear evidence, uh, quoting Hakola, for the, st for the scale of investments that were put into the development of the infrastructures that facilitated the Galilean fishing economy. 
So he doesn't actually, so he's talking about investment and so on. He doesn't actually talk about who invested uh, in these, uh, and my guess is that it wasn't venturing capitalists, but probably at that time the Hasmonean authorities. Second, Hercola suggests a high level of prosperity in the region, uh, evidenced in part by the high number of coins found of minimal value, indicating that intense monetary economic activity and frequent trade exchanges took place in Magdala. Third, Hercola goes on to mention uh, the findings in Magdala should be placed in a larger comparative context that supports the conclusion that these structures are associated with small uh, scale urban fish production, which often included rooms for salting and processing fish. Moreover, quote, it is most probable that urban fish salteries were examples of small privately owned industries working independently of the state and in competition with one another. So hallelujah, we have the free market, right? The free market becomes a kind of natural state of all societies, not just mo uh, the modern capitalist one. Fourth, the documentary evidence indicating tight uh, state control of fisheries in the ancient economy i.e. that the king or holder of the estate made a large amount of profit, whereas fishermen made very little, and that fishing rights were farmed out at a very high rate of taxation and so on. And this is a, a central claim, obviously, for Hansen and others. Uh, the evidence for that comes from Egypt, it comes from documents in Egypt, and there is no actual evidence in uh, Palestine. And I think what's interesting about this claim and it may have some val validity, is that Hakola himself is suggesting that we take the findings from the industrious urban Magdala and apply them to everywhere around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, so he, he's okay to do that, but he's not okay to take uh, kind of information about regulatory control from another context and apply it. Um, so that's perhaps an oversight there. So I hope it goes without saying that material remains from antiquity do not provide us with direct, unmediated facts and archaeological discoveries, as with written texts, require uh, careful interpretation. Irrespective of whether his assessment of some of this evidence is correct, it's not difficult to see, I think, how uh, entrepreneurial language or assumptions are shaping some of the interpretive decisions. In fact, Hercola arguably sounds almost like the finance minister for the Herodian elite, when he suggests that the expansion of the new fishing markets and uh, flourishing local economy at Magdala, quote, very likely opened up new possibilities of at least a reasonable livelihood for ordinary fishermen working on the lake as well. He continues, it is likely that some rural fishermen families uh, who had organized the practice of the trade collectively were able to benefit from the development of the Galilean fishing economy and gained a moderate livelihood for their profession. Uh, now, I would suggest um, that we need to view the fishing trade within Magdala, Capernaum, or wherever, within the broader cycles of production and consumption within an ancient agrarian economy. This is, uh, so this becomes inevitably a question of who has control of the means of production. Fancy Marxists speak for the instruments, both the instruments of labor like tools and infrastructure, and the subjects of labor like uh, the raw materials and natural resources. The holders of fishing rights or contracts, in a sense here, then are akin to landlords or wealthy estate holders. So for all practical purposes can be identified along with the same basic class group. So irrespective of whether uh, the fishing trade was uh, prominent or even relatively, pros a relatively prosperous enterprise, <coughs> it does not follow that the fishermen themselves, even boat owning servant hiring fishermen, were primary or even secondary benefactors. This speaks past their subordinate relationship to the means of production. And while in some cases fishermen owned fishing boats and nets, the lake itself, as with all natural resources, was ultimately under the jurisdiction of Rome. Now, Hercola uh, contests this point by suggesting that the concept of, uh, that fish, like hunted birds or wild animals, was regarded as the property of no one, an ancient Greek philosophical thought. So he's citing examples from kind of six years prior that you know, who knows if that's actually relevant to the first century. Um, so he suggests, goes on to suggest, there's actually no evidence of officials policing seawaters in an attempt to regulate marine fisheries. However, I, I wonder if the evidence that Hakola suggests is absent 
is actually to be found in the synoptic tradition itself. The call of Levi from a tax revenue office on the shores of Galilee right, mirrors the call of fishermen in the synoptic sources. And while interpreters have tended to explain this unity in terms of their prototypical function, i.e. it's they're both kind of people sacrificing their ordinary lives or whatever to follow Jesus as a sort of model for Christian discipleship, we can look at it in another way. The parallel setting of the lakes foreshore indicates um, that there is some kind of connection between the fishing trade and the collection of tax, which I regard as an obvious uh, kind of example of soft compulsion. Why else is there a tax booth on the foreshore? While Levi is also part of the uh, Jewish subject population and not a Roman official, and this is why I said soft compulsion, tax collectors uh, encountered in the, in the synoptics were not the holders of tax farming contracts themselves, but underlings hired by them. So we don't necessarily expect to see evidence or anything of Roman soldiers or officials patrolling the seashore for it to be under the authority of Rome. Right? The individuals uh, were generally taken from the native population, but the higher officials were usually foreigners, absentee fishing contract holders. So it's important to note that irrespective of official decrees, decades if not centuries of social upheaval and sometimes brutal repression would have imprinted on the native population who was really in charge of this natural resource. When the Roman warlord Cassius wanted to reassert Roman power in Palestine after an insurgency by one of the Hasmoneans, he enslaved thousands of people uh, around the area of Magdala uh, in 50, 53 to 52 BCE. And Josephus uh, probably exaggerates, but he says that it was as many as 30,000. Memory, this memory of kind of mass enslavement uh, would hardly have faded by the time of uh, Mary of Magdala, for example, or other people in villages along the shore, uh, less so-called prosperous regions, uh, by the time of the first century. Right, that's that other quote. Yeah, the expansion of fishing markets very likely opened new possibilities and so on. So if we take the uh, call narratives in the synoptic tradition themselves, perhaps, as evidence of uh, peasant social unrest in first century Galilee, then things were not so rosy for the entrepreneurial fishermen and their families. Indeed, peasants do not generally take such drastic actions like abandoning their livelihoods unless conditions have already become such that they can no longer pursue traditional patterns of life. Uh, I mean, why does it matter what their class position was? Well, I contend that their economic status has some bearing on the interpretation of these call to discipleship narratives. Um, interpreters who emphasize that the fishermen were relatively prosperous tend to read the call narratives as this kind of proto prototype for the cost associated with Christian discipleship. And of course, this is often spiritualized. So even though they're imagined to be middle class like us, and maybe, uh, so we can identify with them, it might be spiritualized, so it's a cost of, you know, some aspect of your life is, is lost. But at the end of the day, um, for this to stick, it requires relatable middle class individuals making middle class sacrifices for the work of the kingdom. Ancient writers, a number of ancient writers and others describe the fisher's life as impoverished and miserable. In some cases, men who fished were characterized as unmasculine, as their trade meant they earned their keep by serving the indulgent pleasures of others, particularly rich fish eaters. So the economic life of fishermen, as with all peasants in the first century, was probably one of subsistence, in which any surplus produced would filter to the retainers and the ruling elite. Uh, there's some, to conclude, there's something there's oftentimes, I think, little awareness of, a, of this appreciation for just how radically different an ancient agrarian economy is from a modern capitalist one. And I think, um, just to echo some of what Christine was talking about yesterday in terms of translation, and to follow up with uh, Steve's question that you put, well, sure, we know that translation is imperfect, but isn't this the work for biblical commentaries? Well, I think I'm showing that uh, even in biblical commentaries, these... Uh, our modern worldview, if we put it like that, is just 
always kind of shaping our interpretation of the data. And, but what we see here is more than just uh, an anachronism or an ability to appreciate these differences. The retrojection of entrepreneurialism onto the ancient world demonstrates just how totalizing neoliberal capitalism has become as this implicit hermeneutical frame, a way of seeing and structuring the entire world uh, in every field of human knowledge. And I think Morovsky is correct when he suggests that these shifts are being implemented on, at the epistemological level. And we can think about how we academics ourselves are subjected to uh, kind of this whole neoliberal processing, process of auditing, surveillance of our work and so on, that, and we don't even kind of realize that then that is going to shape perhaps at some level how we uh, view this ancient material and the rest of the world. So this then has significant consequences for the interpretation of texts, and I think any texts, not just the Bible, but I think with the Bible in particular, uh, given its kind of valorization of scripture, if you, can, if you kind of naturalize or dehistoricize uh, neoliberalism within the Bible, then it's going to have an even more kind of significant impact on, uh, or gonna make it even more difficult to resist neoliberalism and undermine it. Thanks.